is that roughly 12.45 to 1 for lunch. You know what to do, right? You have to write your little papers up and stick them up here. None is up there yet, but I'm very positive, very hopeful that there will be about 50 hanging there by the time we come back from lunch and start back from lunch. I just, just I don't know if you, if you guys, how many of you drink beer? Honestly, not a lot. Okay, so you guys are not used, useless, useless for me, because I. I, I am I'm a, I'm a very obviously very very uh, very interested in beer. So I already Googled yesterday all the craft breweries in Bangalore. There's about ten of them. So I visited two of them yesterday, and I will visit another two today. So if anybody is interested to join me on a on a on a hunt for craft beer, but only people who drink beer. Otherwise, it makes no sense, right? So you can come and see me later on. Okay. So. One of the things, we're talking continuously about innovation, and innovation comes with change. And then we talk about you know, all the things that we need to be prepared for this change. We will lose jobs. There will be you know, uh, new robots coming up that replace these people. There will be AI coming up that replace something else. There's a one thing that is very important to also look at, and that is what will not change. Not change. Um, so a lot of things that change, I think I don't have to mention those, but maybe quickly the marketplace of the future is Asia, it's not Europe anymore. The uh, demographics is aging, we talked about this, that's uh, a big change that's coming. Technology, analog is a, is a word of the past, everything will be digital, everything will be online. And if you walk around, I'm, I'm surprised that not more people get killed in India on the, on the street because they walk with their cell phone in their hand and drive across roads. Um, or your, 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 your street level is not sometimes very even. There's always kinds of like rocks and then people stop, you know. Uh, I, I'm, I'm surprised that not more happens. Um, but maybe we have glasses on in the future, these AR glasses, and we just walk and get it put in and we just do some multitasking, whatever. There's a lot of things changing. Uh, unfortunately, we also have climate, uh, we have climate changes. You will have huge effects in India, I'm sure, uh, because of this. We see that in Europe as well. Europe probably will probably be the least affected by it, like really bad. You know, we are a very fortunate place anyway, and then we are maybe have even luck with the, with the global warming. What we see right now is we, we have the skiing. I'm a very passionate skier, and skiing will maybe not be possible anymore in Europe in the next 30 years. So I'm trying to take advantage of it now. But nevertheless, I think Germany probably will be one of the we believe we will be the Toscana of the future, so the, the warm and nice spot of the future. So in Italy will be more desert, Spain too, and then everything will shift up a little bit. So Germany may be very lucky, but some places are not lucky. So these are the things that will change. We know that. We should do something to prevent that, but if you have precedents, I'm, I'm really mean with Mr. Trump, but if you're a president like this idiot, then it will not happen. So. You know, please be reasonable in your decisions. You're, all of you can vote. Please be a little greener in your thinking process, a little bit more envir environmentally conscious. Think about the poor animals too. But what I want to get to, and that's actually the reason why I put this up, being coming up with a business or with a new idea built on something stable is a great idea. Because stability means it's going to be around for another 10 years well. Everything that we do is we project in the future, we think things could happen, but we're not sure. And every time we're not sure, we are uncertain that it will really do. But stability is something that is also very important. So one of the things that I really like as stability is I, I make an example. I, I typically ask around, and I will do that today too, is what do they prefer? What would you prefer in terms of purchasing? Would you prefer to Build to buy expensive things or cheap things if they are about the same. Anybody for expensive? Pretty stable, right? And do you think that will be in the future too? Pretty stable, right? Second question. Would you prefer slow delivery or fast delivery? Anybody for slow? What do you think in five years? Ten years? Fifteen years? Fast. And would you prefer a large selection of the same thing you can look for or a small selection? 
What? What? Large selection. What, I'm a little surprised I heard small ears. Everybody wants to pick, right, from a lot of different things. And then you have ratings. What did I just describe? Amazon. This is the Amazon business model. The Amazon business model is built on people will always be wanting cheap products rather than expensive. I mean the same product, right? It's not, we're not doing apples and pears. We say, I want to have a good product and I want to be sure that I pay the cheapest product for the cheapest price for this product. They want to have a large selection. They want to compare. They want to have fast delivery. That's Amazon. And Jeff Bezos at the time recognized that that was a stable business model. And now he's expanding in all kinds of other things. But this business model will for sure be around in 15 to 20 years as well, this stability. Now, when you actually look into, your, into new things, also think about where could be a stable component. <coughs> a stable component is for, in healthcare, people will still get sick, you know, and people will still need care. Uh, people will need empathy. Now, these are kind of like stable elements that are there that you have to look for. So I think that's, that's all I actually wanted to say for that. I think there's maybe one more chart on this one here. Okay, so what remains stable? Maybe this is an exercise I kind of like wanted you to do, but maybe we keep it for your own thinking process. So I would like you later on, before we go to, before we go to uh, lunch, to put down what you think is stable in the next five years in healthcare stable in the next 20 years and the next 50 years. Just come up with like two or three uh, post-it notes and I'll put, up a, uh, I'll put up a sheet right here later on before we go. I put it right here. So and I'm gonna make a separation here for, maybe I'll do this right now. This would also be something you can build on later on. You can use as, as, as maybe some further information of where there could be good business models. So we will do something stable. Five years. Stable. 10 or 20 years, right? 10 to 20 years. And stable. Greater 25 years. I put a little less down there because I believe there's not that many coming up here. Please also use that space if you need to. Please, for the sake of everybody else, put some things on there. It's very interesting to see what everybody else thinks. Okay? So, we cut that one short, go to the next one. Now, I would like to get into something that is more assuming that we already have a project idea. We already have an idea that we want to check. Yesterday, day before yesterday, we looked already a little bit into Blue Ocean. I will go into this one more time. But I will also highlight some ideas about design thinking, lean startups, or lean thinking. Anybody already knows what that is? The lean process? Well, I can quickly say what the lean process is for everybody. Lean process is do not do too many things for a long time, just do little things, check them, and then revise them. Lean, work very, very uh, fast and very quickly, rather than spending too much time on it. Okay, so, a little bit of background, 20th century innovation, business builds a product and hopes to find customers. Understand that one, remember? So, Mr. Ford came up and said, cars are needed. And the general population said, what do we need cars? We need faster horses or more horses. People just could not deal with the car aspect. It was a rich man's toy. It was very, that's very, very nice pictures. You may, may want to Google at some point in time. New York, 1900, New York, 1910. New York, 1900, everywhere horses, occasionally a car because cars were just invented in 1890, something like 95. And then in 1910, you see occasionally a horse, and everything else is a car. 
change completely around in a very short period of time. By the way, I'm sure that if you would have asked the people in 1900 on what, what they believe will be the car increase, it would have been very linear. And it was indeed very exponential at, at that time. So 21st century, so that's how companies actually build. They kind of, somebody came up with an idea said, people need that, I'll build it. Now we have changed this a little bit around. There's no more business as usual in the 21st century. Meaning you build products and then you hope to find a customer for it. You have to do it the other way around. You have to actually go and see what a customer potentially needs because we have a much higher technology rate and rate of innovation and we have a global scale. When I started my business in the, in the early 19, 1990s, my first business, there was no internet around. We basically dealt with fax machines. And what it means is you were kind of like the champion of your, global, of your local market. So what I did is at that time, is for example, I bought used MRI systems and CT systems in Germany and I sold them to India, for example. I don't think I ever did that, but just assume I did, right? And we had some contacts in India and they had no idea how many systems were available. They had no idea what the price point was. Now you can Google used MRI systems and you will probably find 500 companies who offer that. And you can compare left and right. So that was a completely different way. So actually looking back at my business, I would have preferred that it stays without internet because the profit margins were significantly higher when we were kind of like buying in uh, Germany and the German customer did not know that you could actually do anything with these systems. They, are, they have a value? No, nah, they don't have a value. Just give it to us for free. We just take it out. And then in India, oh yeah, we need a system. What do they cost? And I said, well, I don't know, 200,000. 200,000 margin. And now everybody knows that they have a value, so the customer asks for money. I don't get it for free anymore. And on the other hand, everybody knows what they're worth. Price goes down on the sales side. So internet for me was not necessarily always good for this first time, but you gotta live with it. So 21st century, global, rate of innovation is high, which also means we need a completely different approach. We need to actually build first and find a customer later as too risky. We need to check quickly when we build something. This is that rapid innovation. And that's what we call lean at some point in time. That we do something where we fail fast. Is failing a good thing? No. Well, actually, uh, people would disagree. I would think failing is good. It's just a question of when you fail. Do you fail early or do you fail late? When you fail early, it's not a problem. Because when you fail early, you have not invested a lot of time, you have not invested a lot of money, and what do you do then? You do the next thing. Fail again, don't matter, do the next thing. If you do a lot of, if you put a lot of effort in there, a lot of money, a lot of time, and then you fail very late, that's a problem. So failing in general is not bad, and please have that in your mind as well, that failing is not a bad thing. Failing is actually a learning process. And fail, fast, however, which also means you need to check very early on whether somebody needs what you're thinking of, what you're providing. So the idea is more like fail fast, fail often, fail cheaply. You need to be quick on into the market. You need to check the market quick and then increase from there. So let's go for the apps. A lot of, the, a lot of you have these apps, and these apps typically come with one feature or came with one feature. And then they, these guys who developed these apps added features and added features and added features and added features. They were focusing on the thing that is most important to you. And that's why you got this feature. And then you get release 2.4, release 2.5, release 3.0. You get continuously releases. They add things to it. But get the market analyzed first. Get the customer to say, yeah, that's a good thing. And then continue from there. So we use these words, lean, agile, scrum, sprint. Uh, anybody heard all of these before? We will actually go through most of those. But some of these words are loosed a little bit you know, weirdly, or sometimes you cannot really distinguish clearly what it means. So lean is approximately what, what, what agile is. Agile, and that's what I just described with this fail off, this agile. I'm really agile. I'm continuously working. I fail. Damn it. Do the next thing. 
This is very ag agile, and I, I check the market. So I actually concentrate on creating a quick product, a quick solution, and check the market, and possibly fail. But I'm agile, I'm continuously moving on. Now, anybody heard of Scrum? Software guys here? Hands up the software guys. Well, yesterday, uh, day before yesterday, there were a lot more people who were dealing with software. So with software, one at least. How do you actually develop your software? You never heard of the Scrum process? That's an agile process. You should look into this. This is a very, very well-known international process where you actually focus on, a, it's always what we call sprints, 30-day sprints. So what they do is the team, a Scrum team, so this is a Scrum team. The Scrum team decides for itself, the team, not me as a manager. The team says, I can do out of the list you have given me following things in 30 days. And what they do is they actually make sure they get it done in 30 days. A scrum process is always 30 days. You cannot be shorter, you cannot be longer. 30 days, you need to get things done in 30 days. And that means done by, you need to get the code done, you need to go test it, you need to get the code implemented. So software-wise, every one month you have a new product. And then you come up with things while you do that, Oh, that would be kind of cool to have as well. And this would be kind of cool to have as well. You create a sheet of things to be done. But the Scrum team always decides on which of the things they implement. Because they're responsible to get things done in 30 days. So the focus on these developments is every 30 days, something needs to be finished and shippable. It needs to be an executable code, a program. And this alone should tell you that we are not focusing on, oh, let's just develop something, let's see how long it takes. No, we want to get things done every one month to see the progress. And we learn something. Because most of these guys start off, they don't really have a clue what they really want to develop. They don't know roughly one point, but all the other points they don't know, they don't know how long it will take. And they learn in this process. So Scrum is a very, very powerful technique, very powerful, agile technique which allows you to actually do products and finish products within one month. Have anybody of you programmed an app before? No? Nobody? I'm a little disappointed here. Nobody has programmed an app before? Anybody has an intention to program an app? No, even at the business components, so we want to develop an app? How long do you think it will take you to get the first app done? A year? What do you think? Are you all looking forward to the lunch already? So what does it take? You know, a good app programmer can actually probably do it in two days. He gets something done in two days. Later on, we'll talk about design sprints. And when we talk to design sprints, what, they, what, what you do with the goal of a design sprint is, and we'll actually do some tomorrow, the goal is to actually show something to a customer. And what they very often do is they fake it. They make a fake program. I've actually programmed a fake program. It's very easy. You actually make a screenshot of, of your iPhone. You just do something on, on, on Word, for example, make a screenshot. And then you go into a program which allows you to highlight areas in this screen to be touchable. So when you put on your, your mouse or your finger, you actually can attach it now to another screen, to another screen, to another screen, so you can jump around. This program really doesn't do anything except for it fakes a program. And you can program that in an hour. There's, a comp there's one called Marvel Apps, for example, that I use which allows you to create a fake app within an hour. And the whole reason for doing this is like, oh, here, you want to play around with this? and Tell me what you think about it. This is the point. You want to get input from a customer. So I programmed, for example, an app one time for one of these roller rentals or bike rentals. How would you do this? And you ask customers, what do you think about this? Where can we improve things? But you need to have something to show them. Fake it. So also one thing I would recommend you do for your life, learn how to program an app. It's very simple, actually. 
and get into the modus of getting things done quickly rather than slowly. So all in all, I believe, and I, I talked to some of you who have some ideas, and they want to create something, but I believe in all in all, there is not enough thinking put into the why are we actually building it? For whom do we build it? And how, and, and, and also why? why? What is it good for? So please put some thinking process in that, and actually these agile and lean methods help you to do that, because you get feedback from your customer relatively quick, and you can adjust your developing based on this. Okay, so there's different methods, and so up there is again is the the, the the 20th century startup. So you had a you had a visionary founder, and the visionary founder said, "Let's build the product." And then you build the product, and then at some point in time it was finished, and you try to find customers. So when do you, when would you have hired the sales guy? In this process, towards the end, correct? Because what do you need to say, We have nothing to sell. Now, if you go to a lean tech startup, just startup that could develop from this group here, where you say, based on what we develop here, we're going to do a startup and we develop something. You would actually have a vision. Then you would build what we call minimal viable products. Just things that basically, maybe even the fake ones. Here, look at that. Isn't that cool? And you say, yeah, it's cool, but maybe you should do something here. And these are these arrows. You would iterate and pivot. So you would basically build something quick, then give it to you and said, you said, well, I don't know, I don't like this one. And that would be really cool if you could connect from here to the GPS system and from there back to a payment system. And then you say, oh, thank you very much for that input. You iterate and make it better. This is how you do the lean development. Quick products that are customer oriented and where you take the feedback from the customer in. And in the healthcare, it's exactly the same way. We actually try to talk to surgeons or to pediatrists or to psychiatrists or to whatever and see, is that cool what I here came up with? Actually, I, I talked to 10 of your colleagues and that's what they all said was good. And then you see what they, how they react. Always consider too that, uh, we, I think that was the thing we did on the first day, they may not tell you everything. They may think some things and don't tell you. That's why you have to experience how they work. Okay, and then the design thinking process is in, in, in general the same way, but you actually do that also in a, in a company, not necessarily in a startup. So the product is you do that while you do it at Siemens, for example. It's a design thinking process where you actually Im analyze how a customer works, then you actually uh, basically analyze how they work, then you ideate, you come up with an idea, and when you after iteration, find out that's a really good idea, they need to start to implement it. So this is in Morse signs. Did anybody still remember Morse? The did 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 Okay. So waterfall is a is a is a a description of a technology, of a development technology where you start to have the customer specifications. Oh, done. You go to the next level and say, now we actually develop the, uh, the handbook. Next one, we develop the software, we develop the hardware, we, we test the whole thing, we implement it. It's a waterfall. Everything is dependent on the, on the previous one. No parallel work. That's how normally car, uh, companies work. Now, when you, for example, are Mercedes, and so you want to work on the new generation of models, of cars. Well. Remember that question, but let me just go to the next one first. Agile would be, you do something quickly, you basically check, do something else quickly, check, else quickly check, and maybe you have at some point in time a market introduction. And Lean, on the other hand, says every time we do something, we check it and we introduce it into the market. So we have a complete market feedback. Now, let me go back to Mercedes again. So if you want to build a new, new car, which development would you use? Waterfall, absolutely. Why would you use Scrum or Agile? Because you know what the, what the, what the people know what they want anyway. They want the car, they want a better car than before. So uh, the Mercedes new class, it's, it's no need to continuously check the market. 
you, it's a very complex process anyway. You do a waterfall approach. Waterfall is not bad. Waterfall is just something for a known market. But if you don't know the market, and you don't know whether things are needed, then you have to go more agile, and you're more responsive, and you have to check more. So waterfall in general is nothing bad. It's just basically not something that you would always need for every process. Siemens developing a new MRI would probably do it on a waterfall principle. Siemens developing new software for the MRI may do it on an agile approach because they don't know exactly what the customer wants on the software performance. So you can also split the development process. The MRI itself is a hardware component. There's a magnet involved. There's a RF coils involved. There's an electronic component involved. That is kind of like you know what it's needed. That one I would probably, if I would be Siemens, I would do on a, on a normal waterfall approach. And in parallel, I would do a basic software, also on a waterfall approach. And I would do all the application software more probably on a scrum-based or an agile method. And that's actually how, how they almost work. Um, there's a little problem with medical. You cannot every time, every, every month, release a new product. Because every time in, in the medical field, you have to have a new product. You have to have new certification. That's why they typically wait have many, many little steps, and then they do one package that they actually try to get certified. Now, if Siemens works now on, on re software release 12 officially. What do you think the software release they work on internally? It's probably 15 or 18 or something like that. OK, so one more time. It's just a different drawing. So, um, But it also shows, and I think that's what this, what this picture is all about, if you are working agile, now I think go back to the question before, when do you hire the salesperson in an agile approach? No, you hire them from the first moment on. Because if you really want to do something for the customer, you need to be with the customer. You need to be continuously talking. So basically, you need to hire a sales marketing guy right away. You, you, you may not even have a product, but you need to feed the information coming from the customer back into the product. Completely different setup. An agile team is not a team of engineers. An agile team is a team of marketing guys, sales guys, production guys, development people. It's a complete uh, uh, inhomogeneous setup. Waterfall approach, if you develop an electrical engineering product, you know who's sitting there? Electrical engineers. If you develop the, uh, the, the suspension system of the car, it's going to be mechanical engineers. Very homogeneous setup. So completely different type of people. And what happens in the waterfall, every time you're finished with your stuff, you hand it over, because there's a waterfall, you hand it over to somebody else. And then you, get, you lose so much information, because people are not really deeply involved in this. And that's why, people, why these big companies, you always call them the big ship, the tankers, because they have so many more people they need to actually get things done. And there are so many more communication problems, which takes a long time. And that's why they are a little bit, they are not agile at all. And they can't be agile. Now, is agile always an, is it an advantage? I think for small companies, they can't even work any differently. But big companies, being agile is very difficult, too, because people are not capable of actually being agile. They are in a certain environment, and that's why they're there. And that's why they want to work for big companies, too. The CEO of the company, I happen to know the CEO of Siemens Healthcare quite well. He, he knows that his company needs to be more agile. But he also knows it's almost impossible to get this company agile. So what does he do to get the company more agile? What would you do? If you run a 300,000 people company, how do you make this company agile? No, you have to make it smaller. You have to make the company smaller. You have to give entities power. What happens in a big company or in a government? Government is probably, is a government agile? It's probably the least agile institution you can think of. They are completely waterfall organized and completely hierarchical organized. And this is probably the least agile organization you will ever see. How would you make a government organization more agile? By giving individual departments more power. They can decide 
on their own, and they are responsible on their own. As long as they say, well, I have to ask my boss, and the boss says, I have to ask my boss, nothing will ever happen agile. So the only way to get a company like Siemens more agile is to form more entities that have a specific task, and they're responsible for this task, and they're not continuously reporting to everybody else. It's the only way to do it. So this is why Agile is a very important step for also these big companies, not necessarily always putting these big entities together with have like hundreds of programmers, but maybe creating smaller teams. OK, just one more time. I think I don't have to go through this one here. This is also an interesting concept. I like this one. This is how Apple works. Um, they know they have to get, somehow they have to find the w path to, mo to money. Right? They cannot just work for the heck of it. All right, let's get started. Let's see what we get. They just need to find the way to dollar, but they do all kinds of wiggles. And I am also investing money in companies, so I'm an investor. And what, what does investor typically wants to have? What is it? Yeah, but what does he want before he invests? I mean, what is this investment decision based on? I sit in here. No, I don't think so. They need to have what kind of document? A business plan. So they want to see a business plan. Now, what is a business plan? A business plan is a story how to get from A to return, from A to B, right? A is now, right here, today. And B is getting my return. And that's a straight path. In a startup company, is that a straight path? It's a path like this? I don't know. Oh, shit, that doesn't work. I'll go somewhere else, go somewhere else. I pivot all the time. I do something different. I can also advise you, if you ever start a company and you have to write a business plan, at the moment you have written the business plan, this business plan is obsolete. Because you will learn something new. And you sh should change your business plan. Many people don't do that. They follow their business plan because they believe the investor wants to see that. No, the investor does not want to see that. The investor wants you to be successful. And whatever it takes to be successful is appreciated. So please do not ever do that, that we follow a business plan. Please always follow what you have learned. And if that means changing your initial idea, then do it. But what you have to do when you do that, when you change your plan, you have to inform your investors because otherwise they get pissed. But if that is being done, I think it's a really cool thing. Pivoting is a really good thing. Please have that in your mind too. Changing your ideas based on new input that you get is extremely important. Nobody, you would be really stupid if you continue an approach for which you find out that it's really not successful at the end, right? Why would you do that? So please change that. And that's the graph which I always try to highlight the the importance of Agile. So you are uncertain here, right? You don't know exactly what's coming. So this is the graph of certainty or uncertainty. So actually, when you do this, a certainty graph, it will go the other way around. You are damn uncertain here. You don't really know. You have a plan, but you don't know what happens. The more time and the more money you in invest, the, more the, the less uncertain it will get, the more certain it will get. However, the more money you invest too, and time invest. So when you find out here that it's not a good idea, you have not spent a lot of money, a lot of spend of time, go back and start all over again. If you're down here and you find out it's a shitty idea, then you have spent already a lot of money and time. So that's the, the, the arguments behind doing things fast and checking the market continuously. OK, I think we don't have to go through this. Oh, no. We, <laughs> I think it, what, what they, what they want to show you here is, with this graph here, um, I, I, I stole it from somewhere, I'm not exactly sure where, is when you, you want to build a square, um, it would be much smarter to start with a small square and then make it bigger rather than to start with a line and then add another line because you never see the end result. But if you have a small circle and you know you have to make it bigger, you already know something worked. You already have a basis. You can make it bigger. So I have, I, it comes later on, but I'll ask you anyway. So what is, this is what we call minimal viable products. So when you want to build a big circle, 
And you can already build a small circle. You know how to do it. You know what it takes to get to a big circle. You have done it. If you want to build a big square and you start with a big line, that will eventually end up, there's a lot of uncertainties. So what would you do, what would be a minimal viable product of a car? What's a minimal viable product of a car? How would you show? No, let's start differently. We have discussed that on Saturday already. What is the main value proposition of a car? Getting from A to B faster, right? So if you want to prove a value proposition getting to A, from A to B faster, and you have a vision in your head. The vision is, it's going to look like this, right? How would you show a customer your main value proposition with a minimal viable product. How? What would you build? You could build four tires, right? Would that show that you get from A to B faster? No, right? What else would you buy? What would you build to show value proposition going from A to B faster? But what would you build to show that? Uh, does the engine allow you to go from A to B faster? The engine allows you only in combination with the tires and in combination with the chassis to go faster. What would you show that you go from A to B faster? How about a bicycle? How about a roller? A skateboard? This is a minimal viable product of a car. Have a little bit of fantasy, guys. The engine is not helping you. The engine will help you later. But to create the car, you show, listen, you've, up to now, you were walking. And now I'll give you this skateboard. Yeah, it takes a little bit of training. But you see how fast it is? And everybody says, yeah, cool. And I will do even more with that. I will later on add an engine, da, 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 da. I will show you the sequence. Think about in your product, too, that you have, what is the minimal viable product that shows the main value proposition? So what did we have? What did you have in the back? What was your topic? AI? What now was uh... AI guided surgery. AI guided surgery. OK. So what could you show as a minimal viable product? A game, for example, not bad. That's like a training effort. You make a cartoon or something. Okay, come up with where you show people it will work. Don't worry, I'll get it done. And this is my first step to get it done. Okay, um, I don't think we have to go into this one. I, I'll just throw it up just so you have a little bit, at least you know definition why what the what the, what the, uh, what the lean startup is. Um, there's a little bit of a definition between lean manufacturing and lean startup because lean manufacturing is already used in big companies. And a lean startup is something completely different where you, while you focus on one on a process, you focus on a customer with a lean startup. It's a book by Eric Ries, uh, also very recommendable for people who are, really want to get into, the, into a startup modus. I would recommend you read this book. It's, uh, it's very valuable. I, I could not provide you a free copy of this, but. Uh, um, um, nevertheless, very important. Okay, this one now is the design thinking process, which is part of what we should use in healthcare, and it's also part of what uh, Stanford uses in what they call their bio design process. Anybody heard of bio design? I know that uh, uh, that Abhishek is doing a class, or you did a class on this one on, on bio design. So bio design is a process of where you actually go out and you try to understand. I think, uh, let me get up the second one. Um, now let's look at the left one. Where you try to understand how a customer works, whoever your customer may be. How do you do that? Understanding how he or she works? You have to be a little louder. Talk to them. Go there. First, go there. Talk to them is, again, be careful, because you may get the wrong answer. Go and see how they work. You need to understand how they work. The next thing is you actually observe. Actually, there's a, there's a, in the biodesign process, it's called empathize first. 
you just know, do you emphasize with how they work, what they do, what kind of problems they have. Then you actually try to ideate something, prototype and test it. There's always an iteration in there because you always try to go back to the customer and try to verify whether that's a good idea or not. Same thing here, on the, this, is, this is just a little difference between the design thinking and the startup. The startup you basically do and build something and then check what you built on with the needs of the customer and you build something again. While on the design thinking process you would build something after you understand the problem. So in the lean startup you go, you have a course understanding, you build something, then you check and then you revise and fail maybe and do another one. Design thinking means more you actually go try to empathize first, you understand what the customer is doing and then build something. And this is now Finally, that bio-design process, sorry that it took a little longer to actually get it. It's the same thing than what I just shot with the design thinking process, but it's more, meant, more focused on now the clinical customer. So empathy. Empathy, very, very important. I try to teach my kid empathy. It's very, very difficult because I don't know if that's a generation problem, but my kids think primarily about themselves. This is not empathy. This is egoistic thinking. They think about themselves, but they don't think about others. And they're not capable of putting themselves into the position of somebody else. So if you want to be working with a doctor, put yourself into the position of the doctor. What would you do? What Do I understand the problems of this person? Empathize with them. Empathize with your parents. Understand why they yell at you. I think we were talking yesterday about playfulness and, and uh, day before yesterday. Why are my parents thinking that way? Why are they stay, saying that? That is what we call empathy. So put yourself into the position of your customer, your doctor. And then basically when you know how they work, you know how, what kind of problems they have, you define the problems. You define the problems that you have identified by empathizing with them. Maybe you even want to recheck with the customer. Is that right? Is that is that your job description? Maybe not. And then you ideate. You try to find a solution to that problem you have identified. And when you have this ideation, you can create a prototype or a minimal viable product or a promo type. I was kind of hoping that out of, the, out of this class, I would get at the end of this course something called promo types. Anybody have a feeling what a promo type could be? Promotional prototype. Promotional prototype, I, I'll show you some examples later on, is where you kind of like show a customer what it could look like. But who cares on whether it's technically possible or not? You make a cartoon, you make a movie. You kind of like show the customer, hey, would you like that? And you basically just make a robot that can do anything. Or an, an AI program that you plug in certain data and then it comes up with a certain result, you can fake that. You can just make, just show them, is that something you would like? That's a promo type. That's a form of a minimal viable uh, product. Now, when you have checked that, you always go back, that's why these errors are going back. You need to test the response of that, and when that's all done, you say, I feel good about it. Then you try to actually implement. Then you try to put time on it. You remember this wiggly line and then the, the cost line and timeline? What you're trying to do is you're trying to eliminate uncertainty by doing these kind of tests. And when you get some positive feedback on it, your uncertainty goes down. And you feel much better about it. Let's do it. Let's go into it. Fast evaluations, fast results, rather than actually sticking too much and too long to uh, building something without testing it. So, Where's my software guy? Do not build it. I think you're way too far, and I think you have not checked your customer yet. Have you ever talked to a radiologist? I think you should, because I think that they don't need what you're trying to build. I think you should actually try, try to check and maybe fake something. OK. Um, I think we cut this one short from here. Uh, this one, okay, I, I, this is all the same stuff, so I, I don't necessarily want to go there. But the only thing I want to show you here is on the, on the right side, that what people not doing well enough is 
actually trying to put themselves into the position of the customer. So what one of the things is, I think I will even ask you to do this later on in your homework assignment, is to create an empathy map. And that would be the same thing if you go to your parents and say, uh, try to analyze why they say what they say. Actually, what are they saying? What are they thinking? What are they doing? What are they feeling? Now, try to go back into your own mind and say, do you always say what you feel? No, you don't. You may say something completely different. Oh, you look pretty today. God, is she ugly today, man. But she would never say that. If your wife comes to you or your, your, your boyfriend or girlfriend says, oh, I put a lot of effort in this cooking today. Do you like it? How many of you have faked it? Ooh, yeah, it's really good. Okay, so it's a different story. So please try to understand that empathy also means understanding of when the customer tells you something and he really believes it or it just tells you something because he feels like he should say that. Now when you come with something to him and say, isn't that a cool idea? And he looks at these beautiful young ladies here, he's not, I'm not going to give him that much shit. You know, I don't tell him how terrible it is. He may tell you it's really good and you will be feel, ha feel happy about it. So this is why that is so important to actually kind of try to uh, create in, in your head an empathy map and try to analyze the customer. I think you as a psychiatrist, you, this must be very uh, important to you, these kind of things. Because I'm sure that your customers tell you all kinds of crap and they just tell it because they feel like this is the right thing to say at the moment. And this is the same thing. This is the psychology that is involved in, in product development. Every one of you has to be a little bit of a psychologist. Yes, said that before. So please have this empathy map in your mind. And I, I, I am pretty sure, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, I'm pretty sure I'll ask you to do this in the homework assignment. A homework assignment means you have to think about it together in your team, maybe afterwards um, or, or um, maybe tomorrow morning. So I'm not expecting you to sit here till 10 o'clock and, and do it, but just have a little bit of a thinking process on it. Okay. So I think we are almost ready for lunch now. Let me just have a quick look. We have a quick look on whether I just give you a couple of more slides or I'm going to stop here. So where are we? We're design thinking. Uh, yeah, I'll give you a couple more and then we stop. Um, so there is, and that's something we need to do for the, for the design sprint approach as well. You need to look at, um, at a question that fits very well again on one of these post-it notes. When you have actually done this empathy map and you have analyzed and you have maybe even something in mind of what you want to do, you should actually ask a question that always starts with, HMW, how might we? And how might we make sure the customer is happy? How might we make sure that the patient is treated well? How might we make sure that uh, the, the, the doctor gets his uh, uh, accreditation in line? How, may, how might we make sure that we, uh, that we can make money with this? All kinds of questions that you have to ask based on this empathy map. This is very important for the definition of a product. And again, we will we'll go into this when we talk about the design springs, but these how might be questions, they're very deeply related to having a clear understanding of what your customer is thinking, feeling, not saying, saying, and with respect to what you want to create as an innovative product. How might we? Please have this in, in your mind when you actually know um, when you try to analyze the point of view of the customer. Okay, this one we don't look at, but I, I'll give you the link to this anyway. Uh, Steve Plank, um, he's uh, you know one of my uh, one of my I would say heroes. Uh, he's he's from the Bay Area. He's basically running the uh, lean startup. That was his idea, and he's in, in the interview here with a, a, a guy Gupta. Sounds like Indian to me. 
um, who is running this Indio Bio uh, Innovator Incubator in, in the San Francisco area. And they talk about how to apply this lean to digital health and life sciences. Now, a lot of the things we have actually talked already, but I would really advise you to look at it. You'll get the link, so you don't necessarily have to write it down. You'll get the link. You can also Google it. And I think it's a 30-minute discussion. That's why it's, we don't want to play it here. But I at least want to provide you with a link, with a link on this one. Now, we talked about Scrum. Scrum is something on a 30 on a 30-day scale. We also talked about design thinking processes, and these are very well combinable. So that's why I actually I hope at least you would agree at some point in time that this kind of class I do here, where I introduce Scrum design thinking and other methods, where you pick the one that is most appropriate to you. Because when you actually go to a Scrum class, what do you think you will learn? Scrum. And when you go to a design thinking class, what do you think you will learn? Design thinking. So you, they normally only focus on this one thing, but they typically don't put it together where you, it's kind of like you pick the best out of everything. And you see, how can I apply this for my project? Because we're talking about possibly here software ideas, hardware ideas, AI ideas, whatever. You cannot find a general recipe for that. If you have a hardware project, I would say forget Scrum because it's not appropriate. Software, and you have no clue, you are in a certain modus of uncertainty, hey, very cool starting point is to use Scrum, something very quick. Um, and what you see here in this one, that's why I like this, you always have this design thinking phase beforehand because you cannot even start Scrum developing something if you don't know who your customer is and what your customer wants. So this is a phase that starts, design thinking phase beforehand. You need to understand your customer. You need to understand the burning problem. You quickly create a painkiller, and then you go back and check on whether that's now something that the customer really needs or it, it can use. So these are the combinations, Scrum in combination with design thinking. And then this is my last one, and actually we talked about this here two years ago, I think. That was uh, with Professor Suma, Kurtzis came in, saw. Um, and then after that, we'll go to lunch. This is, for example, we used a, this is for hand surgery. And if you really look at hand surgery, how they work right now, they have a little C-arm. Well, they have a little C-arm if they have money, because a little C-arm is quite expensive. If they don't have the C-arm, they have a normal x-ray system. And what they try to get is a high-resolution image of your hand. And ideally, it would be if you get a high-resolution image of your, of your hand on different angles, like this, this, or this, and then you can create what we call a tomosynthesis image, somewhat of a 3D image. And this 3D image would then give you actually depth information. You know that when you do an x-ray, it's a planar x-ray, you have no depth information. You don't know exactly where the structures are. But if you have it from different angles, you can get structures. Now, they can normally not have a 150,000 euro C-arm, which has 3D capabilities. There's actually, as far as I know, not even one around. So what we have done is we actually have used one of these uh, mechanical holding arms. This has no intelligence built in at all. It's really stupid. It's just a holding device. And this holding device has an x-ray tube for like 3,000 euros mounted on top. And what we have done now is we have actually created a light source um, and have a marker placed. And with this light source that that basically always shows the orientation towards this marker. We can actually know where the x-ray tube was positioned. We don't even have any navigation or tracking on the x-ray tube. We just use it based on the imaging information that we get. And then we can do, these are some uh, examples of a phantom that we use. It's a, it's a structural phantom where we basically, you see that the, the field of view here is different than here. And that by itself gives you some representation or information of where the imaging came from. And we are able to now reconstruct a 3D image with a 1,000 euro holding arm and a 3,000 euro uh, x-ray tube. I forgot to mention that the detector is the most expensive. That's about 10,000 euros, but this probably can be done cheaper. And now we can clamp it on to the operating, to the surgical table. There's no device available for this yet. And the customer the hand search now has a device that allows him to get 3D imaging done fairly cheap, fairly inexpensive, exactly the way he wants. He can move this arm in all kinds of directions and still reconstruct a 3D image rather than using 
the normal rotational arc approach of a C arm. And so again, customer job, he wanted to have 3D imaging. He wanted to have um, basic depth information. He wanted to have a clamp on, very easy to use device. Job to be done was he needed to have this information to get the, uh, to get the surgery done properly. And these are the, the, the reasons why this value proposition camera is so powerful because it helps you not only to evaluate your system, but it also tries to match it with the customer needs. And in this case, we actually went to the customer first, to the hand surgeon, try to analyze how, how he, she works, and then try to use technology that we already had in our, already developed, and try to put it together. Okay? And I think that should be, after this one, lunch. Okay? Any questions? No? Okay. Well, then. I'll see you back latest here at 2 o'clock. Uh, where's lunch? Lunch is in FPH. And uh, could you remind them about the sheet? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I think I've reminded everybody many times, right? And so everybody knows it now. This needs to be filled out by two, right? One per person. I would advise you to go, if you don't have an idea yet, Walk around, maybe you come up with something. And be as specific as possible. It starts on the top with the title. Give yourself, give, give your project a cool title. I, I'm a reviewer for many, for many journals. And I, 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 I can tell you that the title is half the, half the approval. So if I, if I hate the title, then I already have a negative mind. And then I, I read basically with a negative mind. Then you should put down who proposes it. That's important. First of all, you should claim your own ideas. The second thing is, whoever puts proposal down is later on, unfortunately, also the one who has to kind of like defend and present the project to the group. OK? Why was this a good idea? Why did I come up with that? What is the reason? Um, then we have a short explanation, bullet points. Put a drawing on there, too. doesn't really matter. Whatever you want to do, do not put too much text on it. Because what I will do later on is I will have everybody look through all the projects. And we do a dot voting. That's why there is this thing here. You put your dots on there again. And if you have too much information, nobody can read it. Nobody has enough time. OK. Then you should down. That's also important. Who would benefit? So think about the burning problem. Who would benefit from it? And then who would buy it? Is that a different customer? I, I just wanted to, you to understand or, or discuss in your, in your mind, is there a difference between who would benefit and who would buy? OK? Understood? So maybe we have a quick lunch, and everybody comes back at like 1.30, and then you have still have a 30 minutes time to put something up. Do not think too much about it. It's more important that we have something up there that we can evaluate than you being too picky and too accurate on it. OK? And do not, and I'm, I'm meaning that seriously, do not be too Indian, which means you are afraid of putting things up. And do not be too Indian and with respect. You need to be not perfect. That's quite all right. We are not in a stage of being perfect at the moment. OK? Got it? So everybody promise me that they will put one up? One, two, three? Yes. Good. All right. Lunch. Yeah? This is it, right? No more. You have one more? OK, please don't forget to put some things up here as well. There's only like a couple ones left. That's th those are important uh, ideas for you know, stability reasons. What can we do to actually make a business that keeps around for a while? Go ahead. OK, I'll give you guys another couple of minutes. So how many more do we have of the, uh, of the ideas? There's one more. Is that it? OK.
Okay, so I think we're done with this. Thank you very much. Um, looks actually quite good. I was kind of hoping for like 70, but now we have 35. It's good enough. Half, so we have achieved half, right? And there's already, it's also typical, we already looked at that with the professors here, that there's always people who do two, and then there's people who do none. So let's make a picture of this one here. So this one recorded. Very good. Because we're going to later on take it off and rip everything apart, okay, which is not used. All right. Can, I, can you just turn the lights off quick? Thank you. And now let me try to find the... So we had the break. Was, how was the food? The, the enthusiasm is uh, quite limited too. We actually lost some people up there as well, I think. Where are they? <coughs> Taking a nap or <laughs> after lunch? Oh, a little relaxing, right? No, we actually go on. So now I want to go one more time to talk about Blue Ocean Strategy. I have it a little wrongly organized at the moment, but uh, because that you will probably be asked to do something on Blue Ocean on your topic, which you haven't even discussed yet, but we'll go back to this. So this is a little screw up because we thought we were a little further, but uh, I have to compensate for that. So you saw yesterday, day before yesterday, in one example of how this can be used. I think we have talked already a little bit more uh, today about how, what the value of the value proposition canvas is analyzing customer first, customer being in the focus, customer being actually the thing where we learn the burning problem. And what you can do then is you can actually, if you have an idea, you can uh, formulate based on this value proposition canvas a elevator pitch. You prioritize the, um, I hope it works now, yeah. You prioritize, so you see here these, these red, uh, blue ones, those are the top ones, whatever you, however you want to do it and use these top priorities, the top ones that you have identified to actually create this elevator pitch. And then what you can do is you can use this blue ocean to actually focus on the main customer, focus on the main value proposition and try to actually enhance that value proposition by making it more valuable, reducing the cost, and therefore getting into what we call a blue ocean, not a red ocean. So a little bit on blue ocean. Um, there's a whole book on this. I also said that before, we can do a Blue Ocean a course here. It will take a whole week. We can take a course on design thinking. It will take a whole week and so on. Um, I believe you don't really necessarily need to be completely focusing on Blue Ocean. There are some aspects that you may have to have in the back of your mind. And then you can do that. We'll later on have another one. It's called Innovation Segments. It's another uh, one of these innovation techniques, which normally takes about two days of a full seminar. And um, I hope I um, provide you enough information by having it reduced to about half an hour. So if you're always interested in these things, you're welcome to actually read the book. So this is the book. I have actually read it. I believe it's a really good book, but I believe you could have put the whole thing in 10 pages as well uh, rather than 150 pages. But um, that's my personal opinion. So the core concept of Blue Ocean Strategy is the simultaneous pursuit of differentiation and low cost. Differentiation is, that's the blue ocean. Differentiation means we're not fighting in the same pool with the other sharks. We are trying to find a pool, an area of the sea, of the ocean that is shark free. Shark free means also we are probably the kings in this little ocean. And differentiation means you need to clearly analyze what is around, what are the value propositions of whatever the competing companies, competing products are. And you need to find out how can you actually differentiate yourself, your, your own idea from that, and how can you actually do this for relatively low cost because then you can attract very early on customers. So if you want to build an MRI, is that a good idea? Not really. That's too many sharks around. There is these big companies called Siemens, General Electric, uh, Philips, uh, Canon, Etc. There's even even quite a bit of uh, large Chinese companies now, and there's one called United Medical Systems is coming up, etc. etc. They have hundreds of millions, uh, tens of billions of revenue, and do you really want to get into this shark tank? 
if you want to create, if you want to build a, a magnet, it will cost you an enormous amount of money. They have actually, in the meantime, received what they call an economy of scale. They build thousands, so they, they build it relatively cheap. You can never compete with them. However, if, what if you would do a, that's a very uh, concrete example, you would say, I built an MRI dedicated for neo, neonatal imaging, just for that, for nothing else. This could be a blue ocean. I happen to believe it's not a blue ocean, but they believe it is. Um, because I think that these things are too expensive. There still is a conventional MRI. They don't really do a, 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 a rethinking on the design. They only think of in terms of rethinking of the market, but not so much of the system. Or you can think about um, an application where you, that's coming out of my own area of expertise, where you have a handheld gamma camera that is only used for lymph node imaging rather than using a big gamma camera, which is a lot of money, it's very complex, could be a good idea. So you try to find these niches, these differentiation areas, and then you try to offer something that is actually affordable. And there's these four frames uh, uh, network. You have already seen this one chart. It's actually called eliminate, or it, it has elements in there which are eliminate, reduce, raise, create. And um, I think we cut this one here. Um, so what you need to ask in this four crit network, you see up there minus going down, going up and plus, you need to actually find out where can you actually increase the value, decrease the cost, increase, uh, decrease complexity. What would you add to your value proposition that's new to the industry? So in the case of the MRI, the neonatal part is the new one. Which features of your value proposition would you raise? Make stronger. In this case, it's actually a smaller magnet field, uh, sorry, a smaller a bore size where only the neonatal part fits in, which means the magnet can be significantly smaller, less size. What would you eliminate from the value proposition? That's just exactly from the other ones. So the other ones have a big magnet, which everybody fits in, but that means you cannot dedicate it onto one application. You have to have a general uh, tunnel where everybody fits in, and here you only have a tunnel which is only about 20 centimeters in diameter where all the babies fit in. Which features of your value proposition can you reduce? You could reduce probably the, ah, the field strength, not normally, but you could reduce the size. You could reduce um, the insulation effort. I'm not sure that you can really reduce the cost so much. But think about your own ideas later on. I will ask you to actually do that. When you have identified what you want to do, and we have played around a little bit with defining it better, you should be able to actually Think about where are you standing out compared to the competition with your idea. So this is the little chart, and that's when you actually decrease the cost and increase the value, um, then you can create what they call the value innovation. Okay, so you could, for example, now there's a good combination again. You could do your value proposition canvas. You identify the, um, the jobs to be done. You identify, uh, the, you, you rearrange or prioritize the jobs to be done. And then once you have done that, you actually see what is a high, what creates a high value to a, to a customer, or what creates a low value to a customer. So you rate that based on values that you generate with these different priorities. And then you can actually, then you can actually uh, create a, um, a blue ocean. You focus only on the things that you believe are extremely important to the customer, create extreme value, and you forget about the other things. These are the must-haves. And you forget about the should-haves, or could-haves, or want-to-haves. So going back to my injector again, the most important thing is that you actually have a reliable injection with a reliable speed. The second thing, it's easy to handling and it is low cost. And these are the values you really try to focus on to market and you forget everything else that you don't have a display, that you uh, cannot change the flow rate from X to Y, all these kind of things. Now, that's why I bring up a new, new example right here. This is a, another thing that we came up with. You don't really know the complete use of it yet. This is something which you place, it's basically used with interventional MRI applications. So you use it inside the MRI. You know what one of the problems with the MRI when you do interventions? 
Does anybody know how a magnet looks like? Who has ever seen an MRI? So what does an MRI look like? A hole? And how deep is the hole? Yeah, it's big, but how deep is it? Quite a bit. So what is the definition of quite a bit? You, so typically, the newer magnets these days are about at least 1 meter 60 in total length, which means what is it to the center? 80 centimeters. Good. Every once in a while, these easy questions are good too. 80 centimeters. You know what this is, this distance? It's about 80 centimeters, which means if I want to place the, mag the patient inside the magnet where the best image quality is, and I want to do a needle, I have to do something like this. So this is, I would be now at the patient. Do I actually see what I'm doing? I don't have a clue what I'm doing. I can maybe put a needle in there, but then I don't know anything. And I really cannot really put a force on it, and I may not have a lot of space. Now you said it's about this diameter, 60 centimeters, 60 to 70 centimeters. When a person like me who's not completely fat, but also not very small, if I'm in there, you don't have a lot of space. You have maybe that much space. Can you fit a needle in there? I mean, like this? No. So one of the problems with interventional MRI, interventional MRI is actually not possible. And why is it not possible? Because the magnet was made for diagnostic and not for intervention. If you want to use it for intervention, you have to have special tools. So instead of having a robot system, which doesn't fit into the magnet either, you don't have enough space and costs 200,000 euros or more, we thought of another idea. What we did is we actually created this little device. It's a 3D printed device. It has like three degrees, four degrees of freedom. And you place it with a tape onto the patient. You stick the needle in, but you don't put the needle on the patient yet. I mean, you don't stick it into the patient. You just place it onto the patient. Or you leave him the needle out and just scan the patient because here, there is something in there which you can see in the MRI. So what you can see there then is the angle. And you can project the angle and see, does I, do I reach, is it actually over the target and do I reach the target? And you can calculate out what would I need to have in terms of this degree and this degree to actually hit the target. So we put this in, do an MRI image very quickly and then place the needle, maybe stick the needle a little bit in, but not into the patient, be able to project forward and whether we reach the target, I don't have to reach in. Then we actually put the needle outside, stick it a little further in, put the, put the patient back in, scan again, and it's a fairly simple and easy process, and it's a very accurate process. This thing costs about, to print, sterilize and package, two euros. And we want to sell it for about 50 euros. It's a pretty cool margin if you would be able to get that money. We don't know yet if we, if we can get that much, but we hope. And it's a one way, it's a one-time one use article, and then you throw it away, basically. It's a lot cheaper than having a, a robot, and it's a lot more accurate. So looking at, again at our value proposition canvas, the most important thing that we identified Looking at, the, looking at the works the customer does, it's really an un, he has to get the needle in at accurate at the right position, but it's really unawkward. It's a pain. He doesn't really know on whether he's accurate. Another pain. And again, would be if you would provide something to him that is fairly easy to use, fairly inexpensive, and provides a direct path to the target. So hopefully, will work that way. Painkiller for a burning problem. Burning problem first. Painkiller second. Okay? So this is not what I, no, this is what I want you to do about later. So we forget this because we have not picked our project yet. So I'll get back to this in a second. Can I just look what comes next here? Oh, no, so I'll see. Yes. Next thing. So now we are there. So basically it's all done. Now we have to pick your project. And what I want you guys to do and maybe we do this a little bit organized, because otherwise it would be too chaotic. Everybody has a color pen, right? So what you do is, and we spend maybe 10, 15 minutes on it, we actually look at these projects. 
You have some time to look through it. And it doesn't matter if it's your own project or not. Please just think of which ones you think are cool, which one you would like to see go forward in the next step. OK? So what you do is, maybe what you do first is we take the, why don't we take this, why don't we go row-wise? This row goes forward and spends a couple of minutes. And when you're done, the next row comes, OK? Otherwise, it gets too chaotic. And then you have, I would say, you have five dots. So five dots you can either place on five different ones or on one if you want to. Uh, any way you want to distribute it, OK? So the essence is in the speed, not in the, in the accuracy, OK? So can we, uh, Abhishek, can I get the, uh, the light on again, please? You know what I do here? Actually, can we turn off the? Can you come, please, quick? I just want to put it on there, yes. No, one is, yeah, one is fine for the time being, though. So, here we go. Okay, come on, get moving. Yeah. yeah, half of you could be over there. That would be nice. Not be You have something to do as well. I don't want you to sit idle around and do nothing. And you can already uh, think about uh, what would you do with the value proposition canvas later on that I ask you to do. And I can also tell you already that I will ask you to do more things than that. I will actually also ask you at some point in time to do a blue canvas, a blue ocean on your selected project. Now, one more thing to selection of projects. What what you will do now, you will basically value the projects of everybody, OK? Going back later on, we will actually calculate out, see which are the highest rated one out of your group. So and you should take the highest rated one out of your group as your group project. You should not take anything else because you have no expert in your group. So take the highest rated one out of your group. So everybody else group rates for your project as well, and then you take the highest rated one of that everybody else thought. So guys, are we ready over there? Two minutes are over almost. It's a little unfair, the ones all the way on the top. OK, why don't we just go forward and move the second row over here so we push the other ones a little off? And bring your, bring your stick nose with you, right? winner because it's just the one who received the highest votes from you 
what I would encourage everybody here who put an idea up is to, to think about it on whether it's a really good idea or not to continue. Voting here doesn't mean anything. The voting we do here is just so you have, we selected something for your group. And uh, so whenever you, you don't get a vote here or have little vote, that doesn't mean anything because you may not have described it well enough or whatever. It's just basically the purpose is so we pick now finally a project, right? But nevertheless, the one who got the most votes is number, is suman.cam, 16. So group two has one already, so you use this one here. You don't have to clap for this because, again, clapping means we win a, we, there's no competition here, right? So it's just, so you are the group two and you use this one here, okay? So then we have, uh, the second ones, we have a couple of 14s. So we had one 14, uh, another 14. So we have also a home monitoring of hypertension during pregnancy. Where is this from? Wow, your group has one too then. Okay, so that's what your group does. Then we have, so this is, what is your group? Five. Five. So group five. And this one was group two, right? So then we have another 14 here, which is, where was this? Right here. It's 3D tissues from, so you are group six then. Okay, so group six has one too. And then we have a couple of 12s. So one 12 I have here is a unique patient identification number. One we already have, no, you have none. So we take, so let's see for another 12. So this could be one. And we have another 12. There's another 12. Early detection of Alzheimer. Also number one. So we have two 12s, so you have to decide. You can, I, I, I basically ask to take the two best projects anyway and then you decide uh, in your group. So what else do we have? We have, we have a, there's another 12 here, Neo Sound. That's from number two, so this is, pro this is your second project then, right? So that was group two. And then we have, there was a 10 here. Uh, that's patient-specific instrument of pro prosthesis in automation. Do we have a group already? No. So you already, you already have, so that's your second project. That's group number six, right? So who is missing right now? Who don't we have yet? Yours group number three and group number four. So which ones can we take next? So we have 10, then we have seven here. Seven is a uh, gluten tester. Also from you guys. Which one is from you? Let's ask differently. <laughs> you can see for yourself which one is your best one. Right? Which one is it? Which one is your which best is which one is yours? So why doesn't one one member from group number three and one member from group number four? You for yeah? This is yours. Yes, uh, the naming is different, that's all. Okay, so this is yours, so you're number three, so good. So we have a second one for you. Okay? So we have one for three, now we're missing one for four. This one? Okay, so we have one for four as well. Okay. So everybody, every group has one now? Yes? So let me just make one quick picture of this. And then what you do is you basically take your things down and you pick the number one and you also take the number two just in case. And everything else I would recommend you discard, you throw away. Okay, so let's make a quick picture here. I'm not going to steal any of your ideas, I promise you. Okay. Okay, so let's get moving here. Get your project.
What do you think, why, why do you think it actually deserves a high five here? I will give this right now. A high five because we're not in search modus anymore. This is the end of the search modus. You have actually something you found. And in, in real life, you would not do it that way. You would continue to search. But for the time being, because we want to get to a, to, a, to a topic where we actually take an idea and we just try to work on it a little bit, try to evaluate and whether we can put some sense behind it and actually put a story behind it. So one of the things that we will do next is actually storytelling. So we will actually try to make a story up. And we try to f also make up steps that are necessary to get to a end destination, to a final goal. And this is all hypothesis. It's all dreams. I will also ask you later on to put down a goal of what, what, would you, what do you want to reach if you would really do this in 12 to 18 months? And what is like the biggest hurdle on this? On this? Because the biggest hurdle means you have to be aware of, right? You have to jump over at some point in time. Okay, so search time is over. So now we can start this again, Abhishek. So everybody has a main project or a second project. That means everybody also has somebody who proposed this project. And whoever proposed this project is now a very important person because they have to tell the others what, what is the topic, what is really the content. Basically, do a little story behind it. Now, what your job is, everybody else's job is, you need to write down, and you'll get some, you need to write down what do you actually listen? What is she telling you? What is the story behind that? How do you understand that? Maybe you want to put some, some, some steps behind that. Okay, so we have done this now. Well, it took a lot longer than five minutes. But I'm a little off with my minutes, right, aren't I? So I, I need to work on this. So maybe I, I, this is one of the things I learned from this class, that we have to put a little bit more time on certain things. Okay, so what you now do is, that's what I just started saying is, you have about 10 minutes uh, time and to listen to the person who proposed this. And you are actually trying to address the issues of what is she actually saying? What is the core contents? Why? For whom do we do this? Uh, what problems do we address? Just try to make a story out of it. Try to understand what she or he is saying to you. OK? Maybe um, you can already post some some SWOT ideas. What are the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities, and threats of this idea? And you later on create an individual SWOT for your project. So everybody also knows who's the boss in the group. The boss is not the one who presents necessarily, right? You already have a boss. The boss should make sure that we are in time, that we are quiet to a certain extent when quiet is, is needed, and that we are actually coming to a conclusion that we are doing the SWOT analysis and that the SWOT analysis is later on summarized. So I would maybe recommend that you have every one of your groups also has a little sheet, a bigger one, and you do that SWOT and then you write a little post-it notes and while you're, while she's presenting or he's presenting, you already write your post-its and put them on there. So it's, it's to a certain extent interactive, but what I would not advise you to do is to really discuss a lot of things. You listen first. And then once you're finished with listening, do this individual, then you may start asking some questions. But actually, I would rather limit it to, you know, you need to understand and later on come to a conclusion of what the real story is on this thing. Is that understood? Everything's clear? OK, so let's everybody, every group pick again uh, one of these sheets here. I hope you have a left left. Do we, we have more, right? We have more of those. And give up give one more up to. Okay, so 10 minutes start now.
next step would be you create actually a, uh, a SWOT summary, which you hopefully have done by that. So everybody puts their things on, and then you dot vote on them. Just basically do the same thing again. Everybody has five votes and say, which one is the most important strength, the most important weakness, etc. having basically a, a vote on what is the biggest and the best value proposition that you can offer, the best one, the one that is the coolest one, the one that is the most valuable one. These are the kind of things that I would like to get out of you, and you should, like, you should be having prioritized your, um, your uh, jobs to be done, the weaknesses and the, uh, sorry, the pains and the gains. You should have prioritized it. What is the biggest pain, the largest, uh, the, the biggest gain, the largest pain that you, that you can solve, and also from your product side, what you, what you believe is the, the best value for et cetera already, and what is the biggest gain creator and the biggest pain reliever on your product side. This is the goal of this that we should, be, we should have. Please do not mix up the different uh, customers. It's important because then you have completely confusing things. I will give you as a homework later on anyway, that you do more value proposition canvas and you do them basically one for every customer. Okay? So that's the goal. When you're done with that, then we go into the coffee break and then after, so when is coffee? Right now in five minutes? Another ten minutes from now? Okay. I thought it was ten minutes, five minutes ago. Okay, so it's, it's still ten minutes. Seven minutes, okay. So, but then we should have a, take the coffee in with you. We'll, we'll continue then maybe five or six, seven minutes later. So uh, let's not have a long coffee break. Let's rather bring the coffee in here if we can. Okay, so go on till then. Oh, and uh, again, most important, uh, come up with that value propositions. So what are the most, the highest and the biggest value propositions? Because only then, you can use this as a basis for value innovation for this blue ocean strategy. We will not do any more on this, but we'll uh, get back to this tomorrow. And without saying, when you're done with that and you go to the coffee, you first of all give everybody a high five, okay? So I also wanted to talk about today about medical device regulation, but I think I'm gonna skip this for, and do that next time, it's boring anyway. And uh, I also wanted to talk about IP. Also going to skip that and probably will do that. Well, we'll see how much time we have, okay? Let's put it that way. Because we still have one more game to play, uh, which is not typically related to this, but I want to introduce you to a new concept. And the concept is called innovation segments. Um, but before I go there, I just, may I just go quickly through here. So this is all the boring stuff we'll go at some point in time. Intellectual property is also boring. Okay, patents is boring. Commercial aspects summary. Okay, so um, what I want you to do, and that's why I say this up front, this is the homework assignment, and I would advise you to think about it for your. I don't know. You have to decide in your group of how you want to do this. I'm not going to tell you how to do it because that's something that you be, should be able as a group to manage. But you should be doing a little pain gain analysis pain gain, you only focus on the pains and the gains of the different customers or people who are involved, stakeholders. Okay, whoever's a stakeholder for your product, you try to identify and then make a small pain gain analysis. Now, you know exactly what's coming. You will tom tomorrow put it back together. So I would advise you maybe tomorrow come a little earlier to do these things in your group. So this is what they could look like. Right, so again, is something what a person wants and aspires to. Uh, or again, is something what the person measures as a success. Um, 
So what can you offer this person? And the pain is, what does the bad day look for? What is he afraid of? What keeps him awake at night, etc.? So first, try to identify who your customers, your stakeholders are, and then do this pain gain. So there are some pain gains I did. I just put as, a, as an example down. You get this all. Uh, Abhishek will upload it, so you, you'll have that all up uh, later on. So this is just some examples where we made a, a pain gain for a surgeon, or we made, sorry, go back. Uh, we made another pain gain, but this is a different one for an uh, administrator, nurse, and... Uh, well, it's the same. It's pain and gains for administrator and nurse. So whoever is involved, just think about it. Okay. Now, the next thing I want you to do is create an empathy map for the main customer. It, do you know who your main customer is? You should know that by now. Main customer doesn't mean there is no other customers. So try to actually put yourself into the position of this, of this main customer and, and, and think about what you actually realize from this customer? What do you know from this customer? <coughs> this is a little difficult because you may have not talked to any of your customers, but sometimes you can actually assume things, and when you assume them, you later on try to validate them. You go back and then try to talk to a customer and see whether that's really, did I see that right? Did I actually evaluate it right? The other thing I want you to do this is a very quick one, but just as a goal. Now, we're not going through this, by the way, so just so you don't have a feeling that we're not, I'm not controlling whether you do that. I'm also not checking in the morning if you do it. This is just something that helps you actually put your final project together. When you have done it already, it's done, right? And you just have to basically write it up. So it's just something where I want you to think about with respect to actually coming up with a final project, I, I, uh, not only idea, but with a, with a result. So you should now have done a value proposition canvas, and you should have figured out what is the biggest and most important value proposition that you can, that you can see with your product. And then you basically try to maybe come up with, a, uh, with additional aspects on how to raise the value of this value proposition by reducing costs. How can you make it nicer and better? OK, and of course, you do a lecture summary again, right? So at the end of the day, uh, you, I would like to see from you guys lecture one, uh, one page on each day as a summary, plus all the other things that you have learned in this uh, class. OK? So let's go back again. And uh, let's get, sorry, let do this that quick here. We'll go through this later on very quick as well. So OK. So innovation segments. Now, if you guys would have thought that innovation is just innovation, you're wrong. There's lots of different types of innovation. And you can classify these types of innovations in a little chart called innovation segments. And I'll give you some examples. So if you're the car manufacturer, we always, I always like cars. I'm from Germany, right? So I like cars. So I go, I'm a BMW driver. I'm not actually, but uh, if, if I'm a BMW driver and I have a 5 Series BMW now, what do you think the next series, 5 Series BMW will offer? What do you think? A more fuel-efficient engine, maybe? Maybe more electronics, self-driving capabilities, etc., etc. What do you call this type of innovation? Incremental innovation. So basically what it is, it's a product performance innovation. It just improves the performance of the, of the system. What if you were staying with a car, you offer, you basically buy, for Bangalore, you buy 300,000 cars, and you just drop this car in every corner, and you create an app where everybody can use this car if he wants to. If you signed up with the app, you just get a key, you hold it to the car, open it up. You use a car, but it's a completely different type of innovation. You don't really care whether this car is better or worse. You're offering a profit innovation, a completely different business model innovation. Now, which one do you think, just as a quick question, it has more value, the business model innovation, the profit model innovation, or the product performance innovation? The what? No, product performance is something you know. 
you know, you will make, maybe you are able to actually take Mercedes some market share away, so you have 1% more next year. Very, very known. A business model innovation has a significantly higher value. Now, what else, can, what, what other types of innovation could you imagine? Now, I give you an example. If you, um, if you have two bottles, no, this is too easy because we will go into this later on anyway. So you have, uh, you have a product which says this one is completely bio product and this one is industry product. Of course, they have a little bit of a price difference. The bio is more expensive. But what would you, why would you buy bio? Because you engage as a customer, you like bio stuff. You don't like this industry stuff. You spend more money on it. It's a different type of innovation. Now, what do you call this innovation? Do you know this thing here, this label in the back? What is that? It's a brand. Brand innovation. Incredibly valuable. If you would strip off everything on Apple and you would sell this and you would just keep the brand, the brand has probably, the, I mean, they believe in Apple, has probably half the value of Apple is the brand. And you know what you have people who have these Apple devices, or I, probably true for Samsung too, or for other devices. I will only buy Apple. They have caught me already. They have basically lured me into this business model. And I have a brand loyalty. A brand is an incredibly strong innovation. And it's incredibly valuable. Well, having said that, I, I'll show you some uh, other different innovation segments. Profit model, Dell. Anybody knows Dell? What was the cool thing about Dell? Well, it says something here, but uh, they actually were the first ones, and that's, I remember that in 1990 when I was in the US, Dell came up with that. You could order your personalized computer. I wanted to have this monitor, this, this, that. You couldn't do that before. And he basically had an online model. He didn't have any shops. Michael Dell basically said, send me a fax. You tell me what you want, I'll send it to you. And people thought, that's really cool. I can get my own, my own laptop and I can actually put it together the way I want. I don't have to take that stupid graphic card, which I don't want. I want a different one. It was a completely new business model, not known at the time. Um, let's go for process. You ever heard of black belt? Green belt and black belt is basically making processes or, or, or improving processes so they don't have any failures, failure-free systems. So GE came up with these process improvements and basically, that was an innovation that it allowed them to, to improve their process dramatically. Um, Apple, let's go to Apple. Apple is, you can put the Apple into the network structure because Apple has caught you in the, in the iTunes world. So once you have an Apple, you are locked into the network of iTunes. You buy the apps through them, to buy anything through them. You also have uh, innovation with respect to those, we, we already mentioned those product performance ones, right? Um, then you bundle, that's what Microsoft came up first, they bundled products. You didn't buy a, it's a long time ago, you guys don't remember that anymore, it's not, for, me, for people like me, that's really obvious. You could buy Word for $79, Excel for $79, and PowerPoint for $79, and you know what, in the packages was only 150 So what do people do? They bought the package. So it's basically a complete new product system they generated. It's also an innovation. Packaging could be an innovation. Service, FedEx, they pick up stuff from your home. You know, what was, what was it before? I'm talking about some old stuff, right? What was before? You had to carry your stuff to the post, stand in line, find a parking lot, etc. What is it, 100 bucks? It's up there in the front, so she's really ashamed. So she's never ever gonna do it again. <laughs> so FedEx was the first one who offered, don't worry, just send me a mail or, or fax and I'll come and pick it up. And then people said, oh shit, that's really good. I, mean, I don't have to go to the post anymore. I pick it up, they pick it up. And people ordered from FedEx. That's an innovation because it's an invention, a new way of actually addressing a customer 
and they, made the, they found a way to commercialization very quick, so quite an innovation. And FedEx has a, had, for the longest time, the, a really big market share. Channel, iTunes again, is a channel. It's a sales channel. If you have an Apple product and it's not listed on iTunes, it basically doesn't exist. What's another channel? You can be an Amazon reseller or an eBay reseller. This, this is our, these are different channels you have. Customer engagement. Now you have, uh, you have a couple of different, uh, um, let's say, big devices that you buy. And one says, well, mine, I, I will actually offer to give $50 for every purchase to the World Wildlife Fund. I engage a customer who's in that. I will make sure that every time you buy this product, there will be two trees planted. <coughs> Customer engagement. You know, and obviously, do you, on the first glance, it doesn't look like innovation, but it is. And it's probably the most significant innovation. So having said that, and that's my iPod. Uh, 2001, by the way. So some of you were in, maybe in kindergarten at the time, right? Um, or maybe not even in kindergarten. So when I saw this thing first, I'm not, I have to say, I'm not a big music fan, so I, I don't really listen to music that often. But I had, of course, this cool Discman. Anybody remember Discman? It's like this, uh, yeah, it was called, no, the Walkman, uh, the Walkman was actually the one with the tape, even the one before that. So you had a tape. Does anybody remember tapes? Yeah. Tapes were cool. You had the 120 minute tape, and then every fourth time it was kind of like winding up, and you had to take the whole thing out, and with your finger had you. And, and then the disc man came, and he thought, oh, that's the coolest thing in the world, because now you don't have that problem anymore. Well, we still had a lot of problems, because when we were jogging, right, the laser was jumping every once in a while, and it was not really that good. And that was a pretty heavy, bulky thing. And how many songs could you play? On a normal CD, it's only about 60 to 90 minutes of music. And then when they started coming up with the MP4, you could press a little bit more on it. The MP3, sorry. You could press a little more, and then you maybe had for an hour, I don't know, three hours, four hours of music. I don't, it was not a lot. So you always heard the same stuff, right? Or you changed it, all kinds of disc with you. Then iPod came. What was the coolest thing about iPod? He had thousands of songs. There was no limitation anymore. On most of the iPods, not on this one particular, but most of the iPods had no hard drive. So you didn't have any issues with uh, things jumping left and right, lasers not uh, lining up. There was a lot of innovations built into this one. And that's why iPod was actually, if you really look at it, is the foundation of the Apple empire. Because what they did with that is they created a new profit model, system and comfort. They created a network where you actually had to dial in to download the music. You had to pay for it. But now you paid 99 cents per song rather than $9.99 for a CD, of which of the 10 songs you only liked two anyway. You didn't, you didn't like the other eight ones, but you had to pay for them. Product performance, it was much better. Product system was integrated with this network, uh, had a great sales channel, and was, of course, associated with the brand. Now, it doesn't mean that the more innovation segments you have, the better it is, because it also means that the more innovation segments you have, the more effort you have to put into every one of these innovation segments. But typically, and I'll show you some numbers later on, every one of the products should have at least two or three innovation segments. One is typically not enough to be really successful. So what I want you to do now, in your team, you grab a, another one of these sheets. This is not relevant. You don't have to put it up later on. But I just wanted to show you the power of this one. Um, water bottle exercise. Why did you buy this water bottle? Or why was this water bottle bought? What do you think? If you go to the shop, you see 50 different brands of water. Why, is, why do you buy this one? Is that a good brand? 
I don't know. I don't know why it was bought. The point is, how would you distinguish yourself into a water bottle market? Do you think by just looking at different innovation segments, you could maybe actually come up with a reason why you would want to buy a different bottle? Maybe you like a different look. Maybe you would like to be addressed differently. So what I want you to do now is to basically create innovation for a water bottle. Do you think innovation for a water bottle is possible? Of course, otherwise I wouldn't ask you to do it. But why is nobody doing it? It's still the same stuff. I can tell you scientifically, the water in this bottle is the same than in the other bottle with the other brand. Pretty much. There's very little difference. Maybe in India, I cannot say that for sure here, but in Europe, it doesn't really matter which water bottle you call, it's all the same water. So the question is, why would you buy this bottle over another bottle if it's all the same anyway? So be honest, why are most of you buying this bottle? It's the cheapest. Typically, that's what people do. It's the cheapest. Forget cheap as a value proposition. By the way, if anybody of you has only down cheap as a value proposition, you will not be successful. Cheap is a good add-on, but it's not the main value proposition. You need to have something else. So what I want you to do now is, and we really keep this to time, because otherwise we're never going to get finished, you will actually take an A4, sh one of these sheets again, and you start drawing. And you start actually coming up with innovation for a water bottle, a simple, stupid water bottle. And I will keep this sheet up. You can actually think of what else you could do. But you don't necessarily, I would not go by this. I would just think about why would you want to buy a water bottle and what would attract you? Go from your perspective. I give you one, I give you one starting point. And you may use it or not, um, but think about Nespresso. Nespresso, known, right? Different types of coffee. George Clooney, all the girls would probably know it, right? George Clooney makes the advertisement for it. And can we not do something with water? You know, have different tastes? Maybe different concentrations of taste? The question is, do we actually need a water bottle? Maybe there's another ways. I mean, think a little bit out of the box, OK? So I'm doing this water bottle exercise. It has nothing to do with our health care. But I want you to know that everything that is out there already can be innovated. I want you to see, and that's typically water bottles, nobody believes that there's any innovation potential. You'll come up, I'm sure, every one of you will come up with like five or six great points. And everyone will be excited to buy their own water bottle that you just created. Okay? So, what are we doing? We will actually create a normal water bottle, use the different types of innovation. We don't do teams of four, we do the groups that we always have, right? And maximum 15 mini. And please draw things. And at the end of the time, when you're finished, after, I, I'll tell you after 14 minutes, you then come to an end slowly and also try to indicate which of the innovation segments you have covered. Again, do not cover all 10. It's not good. Too much. But maybe you concentrate on some. But don't look at the innovation segments first. Think about your innovation first and then see in what kind of uh, segment it would fit. All right? So... With the presentation, we probably don't do. I think it's everybody's good enough if everybody comes forward with the sheet and we, make, we, we show it quickly to everybody. So I would ask you to get started now. And I also get, would advise you, just with all the other things that we have done in the past, please do not spend too much time in talking. Get done and start drawing. And then everybody should start drawing, not just one. OK? All right, 15 minutes from now. I think that most of you guys would have not even thought Commodity stuff. So when you put people together and you ask them to actually innovate together, you'll find out that it's fairly easy to do. Okay, so let's make a quick picture and maybe ask, ask some questions. So just show it to me. So here we go. Oh, it's beautiful. And get the hairs right, right, first of all. <laughs> It's a picture. It's going to be an Instagram right away. <laughs> no, I have no Instagram account. You don't have to worry. <laughs> All right, that looks pretty interesting. One word. Can you say a couple of things to it? Uh, this is a clear energy drink. You can see. Okay. So we have this is a normal water. Where you get into. These are the flavors we're providing. Okay. So this is what you buy. Yeah. 
Okay, cool. And what you kind of innovation segments? Okay. And uh, yeah, they're healthy. And uh, yeah, we designed that the bio So you would buy it? Anybody would buy this? Yes. Pretty cool stuff, for, huh? Good, next one. All right, so we have flavors available. So we have flavors here. So, mainly it's from the brand Nike. Yeah? People are going to buy it because it's longer than Nike. Okay. But is this combined now or is this a separate innovation? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's combined. Oh, here we go. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, next one. Oh, well, no, not so fast, not so fast. Okay. So we have a semi permeable membrane in order to filter. So, in case we are in a forest or some other place and we need pure water, so we are going to filter it using the semi permeable membrane. But you only sell the membrane then? I don't know. <laughs> we have it with the bottle attached. Okay, and what so do you. We have two openings one to fill it okay. and the other one to actually drink. So, it's a, it's a multi use bottle then? <laughs> so, it's a multi use bottle? Yes. Oh, okay. So it's and, and what happens afterwards? You throw it away at some point in time? Uh, no, you can reuse it. So it's and it's biodegradable, of course, yeah. right? Okay, yeah, okay. Good that I said. Good that we said it. All right. Next one. So it basically that looks like a, to me yeah. looks like perfume. You know. <laughs> so it's basically um, a coconut. So you can like open the can, <laughs> and it's straw from <laughs> Yeah, and like yeah, you can drink from it, and it's like cheap and it's plastic. And yeah, <laughs> that. But the the whales are not going to eat it, right? It's also biodegradable. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Okay, very good. All right. But, you know, these things are, I say one more time, the, uh, it is sometimes crazy ideas, but those are cool things, you know. It, you, it, you always have to look at what would you buy if you have the option. In the, That's empathy again. Put yourself into the position of the buyer. Okay, next. That was the one that would, that was the one that was not finishing. I had to actually take it away from them. Uh, and they, they so um, one side can have water and the other side can have an energy drink or whatever the customer would like. And after use, we it's compressible like you know the paperboard that you get. You can you, know, you can fold it and keep it in. And of course this is infused with minerals from the Himalayas. <laughs> but from the Indian, but from the Indian side of the Nepal, uh, Himalayas. Okay, of course. Okay, and last but not least. <laughs> It has uh, not a traffic light, but it looks a little bit like it. <laughs> okay, so um, all of us like an hourglass figure, right? So our water bottle looks like an hourglass. It's easy to grab and hold. And second thing, let's say I'm a mother or I'm a kindergarten teacher and I have a lot of noisy kids. How do I get them to drink it simple and easy? I have a small straw that pops out for them. And for everybody else, it's just a normal cap and an opening. We also have a filter like what Meda has. And we also have a small coil to like heat the water, like a minimum heating. And you have a cool, you don't want heated water, it's normal cool water. And we have added on, we have um, nice to have, more of nice to have things. You have some degree or uh, temperature indicator and your ML, how much water is present in it. And yes. And it's only going to cost a hundred dollars to run. <laughs> Maybe the first time, after which we will regularize our market. Okay. All right, good. Thank you very much. So it was good. Okay, I, I'm, I'm going back to the, one of the first things I said on, uh, on uh, uh, Friday. Having fun is not a bad thing, you know, and having fun and playing games is not a bad thing. So please, in the future, when you're actually trying to do something new, always involve other people and always involve them in a game. You know, just kind of like, Try to get people, um, you know, in a, in a different modus. Now, I would say you guys are, are not alcoholic drinkers, but in Germany you would actually give everybody a couple of beers and loosen them up, you know, and this is kind of a starting point for innovation. Maybe you have to do different, different things here in India, I don't know, but typically having a good environment, a loose environment is a, is a help, and then having a people there that have maybe not so much to do with your own innovation idea is also a good idea. So I'll give you some... Numbers, it's pretty good. I did this actually by myself but one time too. So this is, can we turn off the light again, please? Um, so this is uh, the one I did at some point in time with, uh, uh, with uh, just as a quick one. 
So I put this, this, uh, this thing up here in the middle here is because you can now click the bottles and you can carry actually 10 bottles, something like that. So it's an innovation for carrying, right? But we also did the Nespresso stuff up there. You could actually squeeze down how much you want. You can exchange those and we obviously have a, a, uh, a different way of, uh, there's also filter built, all the kind of things that you also saw as well. Nobody ever builds this thing, unfortunately, but it was a lot of fun doing it at the time. Okay, so there's an average of one point type. Uh, sorry for the bad quality, but this is not because, normally I would say it's the, it's the Beamer, but in this case it's the image quality. I copied that from the class I took at some point in time. Most of the innovation, if you analyze them, have 1.8 innovation segments. That's what typically comes up. I know some of you had four or five maybe included. Now, this is typical. But the most successful ones have 3.6. So if you're too many, it's also not good because you cannot dedicate enough time or maybe enough effort on, this, on, on, on actually making these innovation segments good individually. But it seems to be like you need to have more than one or two, maybe three to four. Again, going too high is also not good. And what are the most often used ones? What do you think? We actually talked about this today already. Product performance. Making things better. This is the most often used innovation segment. And what do you think is the most uh, successful one? Also that one we talked of. Everything that has to do with finance. Getting people into a modus of spending more money, more regular money. I mean, coming up with a subscription model. You know, we basically every month have to, that's the best business model you can have. Those are all finance related. So if you guys think that finance has nothing to do with innovation, you're completely wrong. Financing is, or economics is almost the most important aspect of innovation. And it's also one of the most important innovation segments. Product is cool, but if you can't sell the product, it's also not a good product. It's not an innovative product. So the economy, please never keep that out of, out of your thinking process. It's very important. Okay, quick one. Value proposition, canvas again. This is one of the devices that we just built. Uh, 3D printed again, doesn't cost much. Does anybody have an idea how you do breast biopsies or prostate biopsies? The most common biopsies for the women and for the men. You basically stick a needle in there and try to hit a target. And then you take a probe out. And if you want to go somewhere else in a different target, in a different area, you stick the needle in again. Different hole. Again, 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 again. I mean, this is not minimal invasive anymore. If you have more than one access part, you have to have two, not only biopsies, but you have two channels to, the, to that device. Prostate is even worse. What prostate would you very often do? Prostate is about this size. And you very often take 10 biopsies in 10 areas. And you have to go 10 times through, and 10 times in 10 different areas. You might as well open it up and cut it open. So what we thought of is, why can we not create a biopsy device that actually has a deflectable needle tip? So we have one exit path, we go in, we have one channel, and then we basically from that channel go like this, like this, like this, like this, like this. So we can cover a whole volume of biopsy areas and then collect them in the revolver in this rotatable storage. So in the top it's a little uh, better described. So you basically get like a little bit of a revolver. The revolver changes. Then it also at the same time changes the needle deflection. And the needle goes then in another direction. But you still have the same access path. Burning problem is you actually have not a minimal invasive procedure for biopsies. You have a more than minimal invasive, many access path. You create a lot of pain. You inflict a lot of pain onto the patients. And when you only stick the needle in once, that's much better when it's in. And then you just go from inside. So the burning problem is you really want to reduce the pain for the patient, and you want to make the procedure easier for the, for the surgeon, because you're already at the position. He doesn't have to find a new access path anymore. Burning problem identified, now we create a device for it. Okay, now you can, we can do the pains and gains for each of those uh, of the customers, so in our case it would be the urologist for the, 
prostate or it would be the, the gynecologist for the breast. And you could ask them what kind of pain you actually provide them. They only have to stick the needle in once. It only bleeds one too, for that matter. So anyway, it's the prototype we have made, so now we have to see how we go from there. I hope we'll be, somebody will buy the patent. Let's, let's hope so, OK? All right, so another homework assignment I want you to do is actually come up with your innovation segments. You don't have to do this right now, but maybe on the way out, you don't have to do much, but you can actually look at your, at your uh, notes, you can look at your uh, drawings, you can look at your uh, value proposition, and then decide what innovation segments you are in and which ones you maybe want to highlight more. You don't do this for me, you do it for yourself. You do it for your own project, okay? So I'm not going to check on whether you do it or not. Okay, now since we have still another 10 minutes, I'm going to go and tell you about regulation of medical equipment in 10 minutes because then I have it hooked and I don't have to do it anymore. And it's, it's actually not so much that I, we, we, don't, we don't have to go in depth into this because once you are actually trying to develop a product, you will have to get into depth anyway. And you will have to actually look at the books and look at the rules. And for that matter, I don't know the rules perfectly myself either. Because if I have to look into it, then I ask an expert, or I actually look for the right book to find that. But that's what I want to do. I want to just give you just a very coarse overview. Um, so medical devices generally are regulated. There's very few medical products that are not regulated. I don't, buy, I don't really even know one right now. And there, there's good reason because why they're regulated, because at the end of the day, life may depend on it, right? So it, it's good that somebody checks on whether they are safe. Now, up to, us, up to like last year in Europe, the CE certification was only looked at from a patient safety perspective. Is it safe for the patient? But nobody really looked at, is it actually efficient? Does it do anything? Uh, the, the, the authorities did not care on whether that product was doing anything. They only cared was it safe for the patient, but on whether that's better or worse than what, what's out there, they didn't care. And that was actually also good reasons because they said, we are not experts in this. We have to ask a medical doctor. If the medical doctor believes it's good, he will buy it and he will use it. We have to just make sure that it's not creating a lot of big safety hazards. So I can even understand that, not looking at efficacies. Okay, the higher the risks of the, of the of the product or the device or the efforts that you have to undertake it, the higher the risk for the patient, the higher the classification is. Now, the classification of the product is very often called a risk uh, class, which is not true. It's a product class, and that product class is just associated with higher risks. So when you say risk, uh, risk uh, class, people would typically say you are wrong. It's not a risk class. It's just a product class. Now, the question is, what are these devices? Because a lot of the things that we talked about, shifting things from sick care to, 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 to health care, from stationary ambulatory health care to home care, make a shift or make a question of whether products are actually medical products. So is, for example, generally software a medical product? I don't think you can say that generally. Typically, when medical software is used to make a diagnostic evaluation or a therapy decision, it is a medical product. If it's simply displaying something that you would know anyway, then it probably is not. Because then, normally, the device, the underlying device, is normally the higher rated one. So anyway, if you have a device, like an injection device, and this injection device is a 2B device, then the software probably will be 2B as well. Even if it's no, if the, the software is no certification at all, it would still be a 2B in general because always the highest classification is the one that determines the product class. Okay, AI. AI could be depending on the level of risk that is associated with the evaluation, a class three product, or if it's only used to inform the user, the clinical user, about a certain thing that could happen and the doctor still makes a decision, a no-class product. So 
Software is very, very difficult at the moment. There's a lot of discussions, individual discussions on whether software is. Support devices, you saw these arms that I use, these holding arms, is that a medical product? Well, we're not sure about that either because theoretically it replaces a human being. Human being holding that device, holding this thing, and maybe also being able to react. So we have argued so far that a holding device or a support device is no medical product, but we still go for class one certification to be on the safe side. Um, because I don't want to get into any troubles at the end of the day. Genetic engineering, what is that? Is that a product? Also, that is not clear because the engineering part implies that it is a product, but we actually work on cells. So it's probably not a medical product. Home care and monitoring, medical product? Of course, if it replaces a medical decision or it replaces a medical doctor or it, it makes a, it basically um, does a medical job, yeah, then it is a medical product. So, but there's a lot of questions on that one. There is some help. Um, first of all, please do not think too early about regulation because if you think too early, then it stops your innovation process. Then you think, oh shit, it's a class three bug. Let's not even continue, it's too complicated. Uh, but don't think too late either. So when you have decided to do something, you have to actually get to know the regulatory process. Write everything down. All the associated risks. Anybody heard of risk analysis? So there's something called FMEA, for example, failure uh, mode effects analysis. And what you do there is you basically analyze every step in the process of the development. What kind of risk could it actually imply into the patient? Uh, electrical hazard. You know, somebody could maybe touch 220 volts or something like that. So all these risks you have to analyze, write down, and then come up with a solution or, or, or a, 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 a way to prevent that from happening. Okay, start to document everything early. Very important. And then you have to this, have this... this it's called the ALARP, as low as reasonable possible. It's you have to keep the risk low, as low as possible, as possible at all. And you have to look a little bit at what, how often does it happen? Frequent, incredibly often, <laughs> uh, or marginal, seriously critical, catastrophic. Catastrophic is death, right? Critical, majorly injured. Uh, frequent, you know, anybody have an idea what, what frequent means? Because frequent is, maybe people may made different things about frequent. What is frequent? How often is frequent? Anybody know? If it's more than one in every 1,000 times, it's already considered frequent. So that's a lot. One in every 1,000, you think, oh, that's not very often. That's already considered frequent in medical. So if it's happening more than one in every thousand, a failure, it is considered frequent. And remote, obviously, that will go down. Remote is then one every 10,000, and improbable, one in every 100,000, and uh, incredible, one in every one million. So you have to be already pretty good with your product. Or you have to keep your harm level down. If it happens quite often, but it, nothing ever happens to the patient, you know, at the end of the day, you, have a, you, have a, you measure the, 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 the SpO2, the, saturation, the oxygen saturation, nothing happens to the patient, and the device just turns off. Well, then it turns off, then it turns back on. Nothing has happened to the patient. It's no risk. Then it can happen more often. Everything that is basic in this red area, then, would be considered an unacceptable risk, and you would not get approval for that, or only in exceptional circumstances. The U.S. does it a little different. This is the FDA. U.S. has this traffic light approach again, has this orange one. They say there is not a binary decision, acceptable, not acceptable. There is one level in between where we say, yeah, but if, like, if, like for example, if, if you get a, a new treatment done and one out of 10,000, of, one of 1,000 die because of it, but five survive, then you say it's still worth it, right? So. You have to have this orange line, basically, in the, in the, uh, uh, on the discretion of the, of the physician. The physician says, yeah, I think I'll use it anyway. 
And then we don't go through these. Um, these are the different rules you can look up in the CE certification. That basically allows you to classify. So it's, I'm just maybe I'll go one, th one device, non-invasive devices. There's rule number one, either do not touch the product or it's in contact with the skin. It's not in contact with the skin. So what is it? Class one. Then there's rule number two, it says, oh, I can't even read it myself. Oh, let's go to rule number three. It doesn't make it any better. Uh, modify biological or chemical composition of blood, body, liquids, other. If that's not the case, no, then it's a 2A device. So if you, put, for example, do an injection, you will actually alter the blood content. So it will be a 2B device. So using these rules, you can actually classify or find out what classification it is. That's why we don't have to go through these, uh, through these rules in general. There's one a rule for non-invasive devices, one for surgical invasive devices. So surgical, if you do surgical, the starting point is 2A, basically. The only exception, if it's a reusable surgical instrument, then it's a one, because you can then sterilize it, uh, or the other ones, okay? Very easy to classify. Same thing goes for surgical invasive long-term use in implantable devices. They're generally 2B, but there's also uh, reasons why they could be 3, if they stay in for too long, for example. The biological effect or mainly absorb is a 3. Undergo chemical change is also a 3. So it's fairly simple to classify that. And depending on these classifications, active devices are generally 2A, and then they could be 2B or even 3. Special rules. Depending on these, you will actually be able to then determine what you have to do for actually getting the certification, how intensive your risk analysis has to be, how intensive your clinical studies have to be, if you actually have to do clinical studies or not. And you, I'm sure, will find this out once you actually get your product you know, beyond this first part where you say, yeah, it's worth to continue. So we now have identified the burning problem. We have this painkiller in life. And now we try to actually get it into the market and implement it. And having said that, I wish you a great day. Um, good trip home. I see you on, so this one we do, to, uh, do tomorrow, so it's not a really long one with the patents. Da, 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 da. This one we have, no, this one we have not done. This one I have given you, right, the homework. Um, Abhishek uh, will upload all the stuff so you can look at it. And... Um, I will be here tomorrow again 30 minutes early. Well, I wanted to be here 30 minutes early this morning, but it didn't work because of the Uber coming too late. Uh, but I'll be here, and I can help you if you want to. I will also stay another half an hour now if you want to stay and do some things, and otherwise I'll see you tomorrow morning. Okay? Bye.